All right, hello everybody. <clears throat> so, um, wanted to do a video. Actually, well, this is a presentation I gave recently, and I want to turn it into a video to put up on the channel um, because I knew this was, you know, some pretty useful content and uh, something that I thought would be of really good value to, uh, you know, add to the channel. I want to talk to you today about microprobe stem, and very specifically why I think it's very underappreciated and very useful and why you're probably not using it as much as you should be or maybe even, I guess, as, you know, correctly. I, I don't want to say correctly, but anyways, why you, you can probably get more out of it than you think you can, okay? So that's what the, the uh, goal is today. Okay, can I advance my slide? There we go. All right. So just really quickly about the presented data, right? Here's Dr. Nick from The Simpsons. Here's your microscope. That's a theme of Z in a box. And you put them together and you get, you know, STEM data, right? Um, so yeah, all the data you're seeing here in this presentation was collected by me on one microscope. It's our theme of Z, all done at 200 kV with the XFAG plus the mono. You have the Super X SDD and the Gatan GIF continuum on here. So just a basic outline, motivation, technical considerations. We're going to talk about the optics behind microprobe and its evil twin, if you will, nanoprobe, and the relevant parameters, uh, mainly probe size and depth of field, as well as actually setting up both of uh, both of the modes. And then we're going to show I'm going to show lots of nice, interesting results here. All right. So the motivation, well. Um, what does STEM have to do with cutting butter? So you might think, well, what does this have to do with cutting butter? Well, when you're trying to do something, it's important to use the right tool for the job, okay? So if, in this case, if you're trying to cut butter, what's the best tool to do that? Well, I would say probably a butter knife, right? Um, butter knife, right? It's safe, it's effective, it's quick, it's easy, it does the job really well. But I guess if you wanted to, you could cut butter with a laser, right? So here you see a, a laser uh, cutting device that's actually cutting through hard metal, right? So now could you do this with butter? I suppose you probably could. Um, if you were trying to get really precise, you know, cutting of your butter, really, you know, precise thickness, something like that. Um, but do you really need to do that, right? Do you really need to use a laser to cut your butter? I mean, I think most of us would agree that, you know, it's probably overkill, okay? So the point of this is, right, you want to use the right tool for the job, okay, that you're doing here. In this case, you're cutting butter. Um, and the right tool doesn't mean the flashiest one or the most complicated one, okay? And so this is where the discussion about microprobe stem comes in. Okay, so now if we talk about the technical considerations. So on current state-of-the-art STEMs, they have a twin objective lens design. So this was a schematic that I um, adapted from the Theme Z online manual. And so you have an upper and a lower pole piece, and you insert the sample at approximately the middle of the pole piece gap. So in this case, your objective lens functions as two lenses, a pre-field and a post-field. Sometimes you also hear these referred to as upper and lower objective lens. Um, but in this case, we're concerned with the pre-field because that is the last lens that the beam sees before it illuminates the sample. So that is responsible for specimen illumination. So based on this, we can define two illumination modes. So another aspect of the twin lens design is that you have what's called a mini condenser lens that is incorporated into the upper pole piece, specifically a lens coil, okay? So when you turn the mini condenser lens on, you introduce another crossover um, in the beam path that is about at the front focal plane of the objective lens prefield. So that gives you broad mostly parallel illumination, okay? If you're in what's called, and that's what we call microprobe mode. If you're in what's called nanoprobe mode, 
the mini condenser lens is off and then you don't have the crossover. So then what you have happen then is your beam enters your objective lens pre-field mostly parallel or nearly parallel. Okay, so what you end up with then is you end up with your beam getting focused, right, to a point uh, on the sample, okay? Um, and it's important to note that um, when we say on versus off, that doesn't mean that there isn't current going through the coil when it's off, okay? That, that specifically means that the lens is optically off. So it took me a little while to wrap my head around this, but there's a difference between the lens being off physically and being off optically, okay? Um, the reason you don't want to turn the lens off completely, right, is because, you know, you have temperature change when you, when you do that because you're no longer putting current through the coil, right? And so that introduces things like thermal drift, okay? So if it, it's better if you just, right, you turn it off optically. You don't have that issue as much. So it's important to note that difference when we turn the mini condenser lens off, that's optically off, not actually physically um, cutting the current to the coil. Okay, so now just because we have the um, additional crossover before the objective lens pre-field in microprobe mode, that doesn't mean that we can't still focus the probe to a point, right? We could still do that, okay, in microprobe mode as well as nanoprobe mode, okay? Um, the difference here, though, is that because we have that mini condenser lens optically on, our convergence angles for the probe are much smaller in microprobe than in nanoprobe, okay? So the default value with the 70 micron C2 aperture on our Themis-C microscope is 3 millirad, okay? Now, in the software, it says one and a half, but that's not accurate. I've measured it, it's about three, okay? So the alpha value in microprobe indicated in the software is not accurate, okay? That's important to note. Um, it is accurate in nanoprobe mode if you do the um, condenser calibration properly, okay? But it's not accurate in, in microprobe mode. Um, anyways, a little bit of a you know side jaunt there. But anyways, <clears throat> if we look at the case in nanoprobe, you're talking about a much larger value for your convergence semi-angle, okay? And I say, you know, large here, right? 25 millirad, that's about one and a half degrees, right? Because 17 millirad is a degree, but that's still about a factor of 10, okay? So this is the, the difference really between the modes is your convergence semi-angle, okay? And in microprobe, it's about an order of magnitude smaller, okay? So based on our value for alpha, we can determine two important parameters which are the size of the probe and the depth of field, okay? So the probe size is given by this equation, 0.61 lambda over alpha, okay? And so alpha, of course, is our convergence semi-angle, and this assumes that we are in a regime with alpha where we are um, not limited by any aberrations, okay? So in order to determine how big we can make alpha, we go to our tuning result from S-Core. Um, whoops, which I'll get to in a minute here, okay? But then the other um, the other parameter is the depth of field, okay? So the depth of field is also um, proportional to the reciprocal of alpha, um, but you're also multiplying by the physical size of the pixel in the stem image, okay? So if your pixel size is one nanometer, right, that's what you would put there for you know, X sub picks, okay? Um, so now, again, in order to figure out our limit for alpha, for how big we can make it, right, we have to look at the phase plate, okay, that we get from the tuning. Again, assuming we have a, a microscope with CS correction, okay? And so in this instance, right, S-Core is telling us that we can go out to about 25 millirad, okay? So this equation for the probe size is valid up to about 25 millirad. It, of course, is assuming, right? We're assuming that we don't have any contribution from the current, okay? So, and that's reasonable if your current values are very small, like on the order of, you know, 10, 20 picoamps or less, okay? 
once you start getting into hundreds of picoamps or even nanoamps, this is no longer valid and you have to take that into account. Okay. You notice, of course, depth of field has no impact from probe size. It depends only on alpha and the physical pixel size of your stem image. Okay, so if we have a stem image, which is square, n by n, we can discretize it, right? And so we can define a field of view in the x and y directions, which is equal to the physical pixel size multiplied by the number of pixels in either direction. So the physical pixel size, of course, is equal to the field of view divided by the number of pixels. And then we can define the Nyquist limit as equal to twice the pixel size, OK? So then if we look at this in relation to the probe itself, OK, if we have a probe size here, now, of course, this example here, this is a, a situation where we don't have any CS correction, and you're looking at a case where we don't have proper focus, right? We're over-focused here, and we would need to under-focus to move the plane of least confusion to the sample. But I did this deliberately so you could actually see the probe size um, more accurately here, OK? But the point of this is that the probe size, if it is less than the Nyquist limit, this means that the detail in our image is not limited by the probe size. It means it's limited by the pixel size, OK? So that's the important takeaway here. So we can come up with some fairly straightforward um, data here in tables. So if we look at microprobe stem and how this relates to the Nyquist limit, so again, we're assuming you know, these parameters here are value for alpha, and this is what we have for our XFEG and monochromator. And we're again assuming 200 kilovolts, okay? So if we look at the different spot numbers here, so those are the current values that we're getting. Then we can calculate the probe size. OK, so now once we take into account the current, right, the equation we had before no longer is valid, OK, except when you're up around the, um, you know, the higher spot numbers, right, like spot 10, OK? Um, so what you have to do in that case is you could punch this information into S-Core, and that will give you the answer for the probe size, OK? OK, so then we can define what's called a magnification limit if we're assuming 512 by 512 um, image size. OK, so basically and, and that, of course, has associated with it a field of view. So basically what this means is. You would have to exceed this magnification before the probe size is limiting your detail. OK. So if we look at, say, spot number five, as long as we are at 225,000 X, which corresponds to a field of view of 390 nanometers or less, we are not limited by the size of the probe in terms of the detail that we see, okay? And then, right, we can figure out pixel size, and we know alpha, excuse me, so we can calculate the depth of field, okay? So we can see here that um, and now the depth of field, of course, is corresponding to the field the field of view indicated, which, of course, you can calculate a pixel size based on that, right? So we can see here that our depth of field um, is getting less as we increase the magnification, which is exactly what we would expect, okay? But... Uh, we're at several tens of nanometers into the hundreds of nanometers, uh, depending on what spot number we're at. We can do the same thing with nanoprobe mode, and we see the same behavior with spot size. So as the spot number goes up, the current goes down. We can do the same thing with the probe size. But what's really interesting here is basically all the way up to about one nanoamp of current around spot four, we can still get atomic resolution. OK, so that's a two angstrom probe, and that should be capable of giving you atomic resolution. OK, so you'd have to basically exceed a nanoamp of current before you start to run into a potential problem there. So now if we look at the mag limit, well, these are going to be a lot higher, of course, because your probe sizes are much smaller. OK, and that, of course, is giving you a smaller field of view. 
And now our depth of field that corresponds here to these fields of view is now much smaller, okay? So we're down here around 10 nanometers or less, okay? When you're up around several million X and you're in a field of view that's just a few tens of nanometers, your depth of field is literally just a few nanometers here, okay? So, you know, we're going to see how that um, impacts us here in, in a minute, okay? And the last thing I want to mention here is just, you know, the nuts and bolts of aligning the microscope in both of these modes, okay? So in nanoprobe mode, th this is all the hoops you got to jump through, okay? So adjust your monochromator, focus and shift, center your C2 aperture, focus with C3, beam tilt, which is rotation center, um, focus your image with stage Z, and then you have to do, you know, your, your aberration tuning, right? Correct course A1, correct course B2, uh, then you can do fine A2, B2, and fine A1, C1. Of course, we have S-Core that we can use, and uh, OptiStem if you also have that as well. If you look at the case of microprobe stem, and then, sorry, one last thing. So you see the difference in color between the steps. That that um, is implying the state of the microscope, okay? So the red is just in TEM mode. Um, the green... That is in STEM mode with diffraction off. The blue is in STEM mode with diffraction on. And then the cyan is STEM mode where you're actually looking at the STEM image. Okay, so we have basically four different configurations we have to use in nanoprobe. In microprobe, though, it's a little bit less complicated. Okay, um, so you notice, right, that things are a little bit that they're just easier here, right? Um, we don't have to do really, and the really the, easy, the the big thing is we don't have to worry so much about dealing with the aberrations. Okay, we're not dealing with a situation where we're aberration limited, so things become much more um, simplified, right? Um, you notice that there's no steps that really involve um, stem mode with diffraction on, right? That would be like where you're looking at the Ronchi gram, okay? So in terms of just ease of alignment, right? Microprobe stem really has a, a, an advantage here. Okay, so resolution, obviously nanoprobe is, is better. You want atomic resolution, you need to do this in nanoprobe, but we did see with that table, microprobe, we can still get, in principle, sub nanometer. Depth of field, microprobe has a big advantage here because you have a small alpha, okay? So the implication is when you have large topographical variation, microprobe is gonna be advantageous for that. If you have a situation where you're worried about beam damage, you have a larger probe in microprobe, okay? So if your current is the same, you're gonna spread that dose over a larger area. So principal damage is gonna be less of a concern. And then we saw just a minute ago how it's easier to set up microprobe versus nanoprobe. All right, so now let's look at some actual results here. So if we look at head of stem of just platinum, deposited via e-beam that you're making, you know, for lamella prep, okay? So here's nanoprobe stem. Our convergence angle, semi-angle is 22 millirad, and it's a very nice image of, you know, platinum grains, right? You can see atomic detail in there very clearly, just as we would expect, okay? If we look at the case for microprobe stem, and so this is the same current, but we've cut the alpha value down to 3 millirad. So we're no longer seeing atomic detail, but we can still clearly resolve the grains, okay? So we can resolve the grains, but not with atomic detail, as we would expect. But it's really interesting to see if we look at a material with a high or a large lattice constant, okay? So 6H silicon carbide, it has a, it, it's a hexagonal lattice, okay? And its C lattice constant is about one and a half nanometers. Okay, so if we're looking down the 112 bar zero zone axis, okay, we can actually image this, okay? We can actually resolve this. So if you look in the, the stem image here, you can see those vertical lines that corresponds to the zero, triple zero one D spacing for six H silicon carbide, okay? If you take the FFT, right, you see the two spots there, right, that corresponds to that D spacing as well. Okay, and so then if we actually um, look at the profile here and we average it 
across the image from top to bottom, we can see very clearly that we have the despacing resolved here. Okay, so the peak to peak distance is one and a half nanometers, which corresponds to the C lattice constant. Okay, so that is resolvable with microprobe stem. Okay, so that's close to a nanometer, right? And we saw with the, the table before, um, in principle, we should be able to get even less than this. Okay, I just, I didn't have a, you know, a good sample to test it with, but, you know, we are actually seeing that here. Okay. Okay, so now if we look at a situation where we have a lot of topographical variation, so again, same configure, same two configurations we saw before. Okay, so these are iron oxide um, nanoparticles with a, a silica coating. Okay, so you can see in the image with data probe that parts of my image are not in focus. So I optimize the focus for the middle. Okay, but you can see in some of the areas around the edges it's getting blurry, right? And that's again because your depth of field is not very large. Okay, but if we look at the same image in microprobe mode, right, for the same ROI, we don't have that problem anymore, okay? So we have basically the entire field of view is now in focus here, okay? So we have a really large advantage here when we're dealing with topographical variations. So here's an example of this. So this is microprobe stem EDS. So this isn't just for imaging. You can do this analytically as well. And this is one of the areas where it really shines, in my opinion, is using it for analytical work. Okay. So if you're doing any kind of analytical work, chemical mapping, EDS, eels, that's in the micro scale, you really sh have no need to do this in nanoprobe. There's really no reason why you would want to use anything but microprobe. Okay. So we have this material. This is um, etched calcium lanthanum sulfide. Okay, so here's the head of stem image, and S denotes the surface of the, the sample. So you see an interesting microstructure here where we have some porosity near the surface. We have some grain, some granularity. It looks like the grains get bigger. Unfortunately, we have some wonderful curtaining there because of those pores, right? Unfortunately, that's what happens is those pores serve as nucleation site for curtains when we when we do fib, okay? But it's kind of unclear looking at the microstructure how this would relate to the composition, okay? But when we do the EDS mapping, what we see is that we have three clear regions in the sample. So we have one that is very rich in oxygen, and then we have another that is rich in sulfur, but not calcium or oxygen. And then we have another that is rich in sulfur and calcium, okay? I didn't show the lanthanum because the lanthanum was basically the same everywhere, okay? If we overlay these, we can see this very clearly, right? So we have these three zones here, okay? So again, this is fairly coarse scale, right? As far as, you know, STEM is concerned. And this was done with a really large probe current. Okay, so several nanoamps. Okay, but getting really nice maps here, great signal, you know, and there's no reason why you you wouldn't want to to do this at this kind of scale. If we look at something a little finer, so we've got these um, organic coated magnetite particles that also have a silica coating. There's your head of stem image. Again, this is with microprobe stem. Our current is a lot less, though. It's about one third of what we had previously in the last example. Okay, but the advantage again, we have like one of these. So in a, with the lamella, the lamella is going to be flat. Okay, assuming you're not tilting the stage a lot, so you don't have as many issues with depth of field. Okay, but with these nanoparticle clusters, that can be an issue. Okay, so this is again where microprobe stem can really help you. Um, is because the particles don't usually sit flat, they cluster together, you have, you know, topographical variation. And so you can use it not just for imaging, but also for analytical work, okay? You can see very clearly that we're resolving the iron um, in the core, but we're also resolving the silicon in the shell and the shell on top of the silica shell, which is organic, okay, the carbon. Um, so these maps, you notice with the silicon K and iron K, I didn't specify alpha. That's because both the alpha and beta peaks contribute to those maps. 
with the carbon, there is only an alpha peak. So that's why I specified alpha. If we overlay it, we can see very clearly nice rendering of this and that we have the structure that we were expecting to have here. Okay, and this is a much finer example. Okay, so this is an alumina hafnium zirconium oxide super lattice structure. And this is the microprobe stem image, which was taken at, again, a fairly high current, nearly two nanoamps, okay? So this is what everything is composed of. So we have silica on the outside, and then the super lattice is sandwiched by tungsten above it and below it, okay? So if we switch our instrument to nanoprobe, and we mag in really closely on the super lattice structure, so this is a really nice out of stem image of one of these layers, okay? So you can actually see in the third layer uh, some really nice atomic level detail. So this was actually an instance where I very meticulously and painstakingly aligned that layer to the zone axis that it was in, okay? Those layers are about eight and a half nanometers thick. OK, so that was, you know, very meticulous work um, that I eventually was able to do because I had to relocate the area, had to tilt, do all that. But I was able to do it and I got some really nice images for it. So I was very proud of that. So I, I wanted to put that in here. Right. Um, but anyways, right. That's your your hafnium zirconium oxide. That's your alumina. The alumina is only one and a half nanometers, though. OK, that's all. OK, so the question is, right, we can we can see that in the microprobe stem image as well as the nanoprobe stem image, okay? But can we also see that analytically if we do, say, EDS mapping? Okay, so again, if we do EDS mapping, there's our height of stem, and there's our X-ray maps for the six relevant elements, okay? And so we can see very clearly that, yes, we can resolve the alumina very clearly, okay? Um, I would like to point out, though, that we are seeing some artifacts, fortunately. Uh, we see hafnium, aluminum, and zirconium in the tungsten, um, which could be a discussion, you know, completely and unto itself about why we see that. I did want to point that out. Um, again, you'll notice there's only a subscript written for the oxygen K. That's because the rest of those um, maps, they're fitting an entire X-ray family, and there's more than just an alpha peak involved. But the point is, right, even in microprobe stem, okay, and again, this was with, you know, almost two nanoamps of current, we can resolve those really thin alumina layers. So if we also look at a profile here, right, we integrate the profile across the interface, and this is not ideal because the interface does have some, you know, undulations to it, but we can still do it anyway. Okay, it'd be better if they were, you know, perfectly flat, but it's not. But anyways, we can see this in the, um, averaged X-ray profiles as well, okay, um, that were resolving the alumina. And again, right, we still see the artifacts. It's a little bit more obvious here. Um, you can see very clearly how in the tungsten, right, the hafnium, for instance, doesn't go to zero. Probably the worst artifact, though, is that you're seeing um, the aluminum signal in the tungsten, right? That's basically the same height as where you actually do have alumina. So again, um, now, part of the lack of the sharpness of the interface of the um, profiles is due to the fact that you can see in in the the layers, right? Is they're not perfectly flat. Okay, so when you're integrating from side to side, that's going to be reflective in that. So, but you know, you get a nice noise smoothing effect if you do that. You know, over a wide a wide um, left to right field of view. Okay, and then last but not least, I did want to show some eels data here. Okay, because you can do microprobe stem eels as well. Okay, so if we look at the head of stem image, right? So what this is, this is um, platinum that was deposited on silicon via ion-assisted deposition. And so this actually has a very unique microstructure. Okay, so basically everything from the chromium above, right? The chromium and the e-beam platinum, that's all... Um, part of the sample prep, okay? Everything else is actually the sample itself. So you can see that the platinum um, is kind of discontinuous. 
um, you can see that you have this structure in the silicon, which is kind of like wispy and porous, right? Porous, there we go. That's the better word, okay? And then it looks like it's kind of almost exploded in a way, right? Um, so what's going on here chemically, right? The chromium, that, that was a protective coating put on before making lamellas, and then the E-beam platinum, that's from the, the lamella prep, okay? So if we use this area to map, okay, we can map five elements, okay? We'll map the silicon, the platinum, the carbon, the chromium, and the oxygen, okay? And we can render all this together, and we're still seeing detail here that's deep into the nanoscale, right? Um, you can see particularly with the, the silicon and the carbon um, resolving features that are really small, you know, down around a nanometer or two nanometers here, okay? And that's exactly what we would expect just like we were doing with the EDS, okay? Okay, this was with about 400 picoamps of current, so not quite as high as what we were using before. Generally speaking, you don't need as much current when you're doing um, eels compared to EDS uh, because your your signal to noise in your maps tends to be better, which is, you know, that again, could be a topic for another discussion at some point. But anyways, wanted to show you an example of microprobe stem eels as well. All right, so just to summarize, I think microprobe stem is awesome. Um, I think it's very, it is, I don't think it is, it's very easy to use and optimize and very effective. Really, the only limitation is is for atomic resolution work, right? But again, that's why you have nanoprobe stem, right? So obviously, when you're spending, you know, several million dollars on a microscope, that's why you're buying it. You're not buying it so you can just get nanoscale resolution. You're buying it so you can get atomic scale resolution. And that's why you have nanoprobe stem, okay? Um, so... I say we're into October. Let's call October Microprobe STEM Awareness Month, okay? Because I think that this isn't getting the um, the usage and notoriety that it deserves, okay? I make use of it all the time. I try to tell people that I train all the time as well. Um, I will state that this, you know, on the Themis, it's a little bit different on like a Talos. So with a Talos, it's not quite as, I don't want to say effective, but it doesn't work quite the same way um, as it does on the Themis. But on the Themis, yes, this is this is something that you definitely want to make use of. All right. So if you have questions or comments, um, please feel free to you know, email me as usual. Right. And you're supporting my channel if you're watching this. And so thank you for your time and attention. And uh, hope everything is going well for you.